We begin today's roundup with Paul Krugman's analysis of the Republican plan to cripple government. If they take power, nobody knows for sure what will happen in the midterm elections. But if Republicans take one or both houses of Congress, the most important question will be one star is getting hardly any public attention. What will the Biden administration do when the G.O.P. try to blow up the world economy by refusing to raise the debt limit? In particular, will Democrats be able to take the extraordinary actions the situation will demand? Doing whatever it takes to avoid being blackmailed? Chris Lehman at The Nation. Congressional Democrats are banking on the GOP's notional 2022 agenda running afoul of a midterm electorate increasingly skeptical of the party's alarmist culture war messaging. At a videotaped event for the rollout of the so-called commitment to America with sympathetic voters outside of that, McCarthy nodded in, as one audience member bemoaned the Marxist agenda, overtaking COVID hobbled public schools. Fellow lawmaker panelists such as QAnon enthusiast Marjorie Taylor Greene, R. Gaw, and Trump toady Jim Jordan, R. Ohio, were not exactly walking advertisements for moderation in power. On the openness of Donald Trump's anti-Semitism, Jennifer Rubin at the Washington Post says the Republican Party will still stick by him. As they have done the past, Trump has uttered this sort of stuff before, without any noticeable pushback from his party. Virtually the first time Republicans condemn anti-Semitism is when it comes from the Samsungs. Every Republican who appears on a cable news program should be quizzed about this. In particular, reporters should ask House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, R. Califf, how he can keep going on bended knee to Mar-a-Lago or promise to put Green back on committees if the GOP wins the House majority. McCarthy you might recall, deployed his own unsubtle anti-Semitic trope during the 2018 election, when he warned in a flap that, we cannot allow Soros, Steyer and Bloomberg to buy this election. The three billionaire Democratic donors he mentioned, George Soros, Tom Steyer and Mike Bloomberg, all just happened to be Jewish, though he denied his tweet had anything to do with religion. Meanwhile, David Graham explores Trump's corrupt dealing. The Trump Organization also charged the traffic service as much as $1,185 per night for agents. Protecting Trump family members. Nearly six times the usual allotted rate for government employees. In all, the House report found with the Secret Service spent at the $1.4 million in taxpayer money at the Trump International and other Trump properties and probably more, by the output of federal spending. $1.4 million is just a great deal of money. However the government has spent $5.4 trillion this fiscal year. What is offensive here is not the run. Even the naked profiteering. The Secret Service couldn't shop around. Agents had to stay at the hotel to use the family members. The Trump Organization treated that as an easy way to transmit the GPS, sending public money directly to the president's own pockets while claiming that it offered agents huge discounts. It was a brazen parody of what it means to be a public servant. At the road, Joel Mathis looks at E. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's impact on the Supreme Court. Originalism is a term usually associated with the C340's Bluetooth. But Jackson quickly showed she is willing to make originalist arguments for progressive ends. In an Alabama voting rights case, for example, she pushed back against the notion that the Constitution is always supposed to be short to racial considerations. The 14th and 15th Amendments, she argued were backquote backquote Mac additions to the lanyard, designed backquote backquote to ensure that people who had been discriminated against the freedmen during the Reconstruction period were actually brought equal to everyone else in case. On a final note, don't miss this excellent piece by Elaine Godfrey at The Atlantic on John Fetterman and his ability 
to empathize with voters. A candidate's health is, of course, a legitimate election issue. It's fair for voters to have questions about Fetterman's ability to do the job of a senator. But the interesting thing I've learned while reporting on this phone that, for many Fetterman fans, his stroke doesn't seem to have given them any pause at all. That could end be surprising. Partisanship is a powerful thing. But otherwise these supporters, the fact that the Belkin had an ischemic stroke, something nearly 700,000 Americans experience annually, actually makes him even more relatable than he already was. Again and again, when I asked at a recent rally in Pennsylvania about the candidate's health, people in attendance launched into detailed descriptions of their own health scares and struggles. Their father's heart attack, their sister's cancer, and how they've managed to bounce back. So what? These voters told me. It can able to any of us.